I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. Author, executive, activist. All are accurate in describing Kim Box, a former executive with Hewlett Packard who at one time ran a global organization of over 15,000 people, can now add Emmy winner to her resume for her work in the KVIE documentary Collision Course, Teen Addiction Epidemic. Kim joins us today to talk about her experiences as a corporate executive, her transition into startup entrepreneur, and her work as founder of Pathway to Prevention, stemming the tide of teen substance abuse. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Scott. It's great to be here. So, what's it like <laughs> to be part of winning an Emmy? Tell us about that journey. Let me tell you about it. This is just, it's been amazing, actually. And it started about five years ago when myself and a, a group of parents, basically, we're experiencing what was going on in our community with teens and substance abuse. So we had this idea that we really wanted to make a difference. How can we really change what's happening with our teens? They're using recreational alcohol drugs and turning into um, full-blown addiction. So we got the idea to do a documentary because we thought, well, if we go out and talk about it in the community, we can only reach so far. So we embarked on this journey. We found some amazing people, actually a producer that is part of the American Leadership Forum Joyce Mitchell and a team of folks to work on this and had a passion for the subject as well. And lo and behold, we raised the money, we had a vision for what we were doing, and, um, and the team did an excellent job of telling the story of basically it's teens and parents talking about what happened to them so that we can have other teens and parents watching the documentary and thinking, I don't want to go there, you know, I want to make something different of my life and, and not um, get caught up in addiction. So the, the team um, last June had um, gone, got the, the film got nominated for an Emmy and um, our team of producer, director, and um, editor, and uh, narrator all won Emmys for the, the award. Did you ever expect this type of acceptance? Well, you know, we had a vision. We, we saw the film mm -hmm. and, and we thought, this is just amazing. I mm -hmm. mean, it was so powerful and everybody that watched it said this, but to actually win the Emmy, having our film win the Emmy, I can tell you it was one of the proudest moments of my life when they said, and the Emmy goes to Collision Course. It was just amazing. And, and really, the best part about it is it's going national and it's getting more acclaim to get aired more so more people can see the film and we can help change lives and help get, spread awareness and education about teens and addiction. Describe the problem to us. What are we facing? Well, what we're facing is teens, you know, everyone thinks when, when people are young, we, know, we all know kids experiment and um, they go out and try recreational drugs or they might think, you know, I'm just going to party. It's something they do. And, and uh, the problem is that kids and 12 and 13 year olds, usually a time when people start experimenting, are now doing prescription drugs as a first time of experimentation and it's turning into addiction. It's let's not... let, let's talk a little bit about okay. that because what surprised me was learning that we think about marijuana, cocaine, uh, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, heroin as the places that we need to be most concerned about, but we don't think about our own medicine cabinet. Right. Give us a, a little bit of background on what's mm -hmm. really going on. So what's happening is prescription drugs are easy to get because people have them in their, like you said, in their medicine cabinets. So it's easy to take, it's easy to carry in your pocket, and kids think because it's from a doctor, it's safe. They don't, they don't think of it as something like a street drug. They think of it as, oh, this is something a doctor prescribes. And actually, a lot of parents think that too. They think that if a doctor prescribed it must be okay, but the problem is many of these prescription drugs are actually very highly addictive. So. The people at home want to know what drugs are we talking about? What is it that we need to be watching out for? Well, prescription drugs that are really dangerous, Vicodin, Oxycontin, Norco, you know, they're all opiate type drugs, and there's other types of drugs as well. You know, you have Adderall and, and Ritalin, those are addictive drugs too that can lead to other addictions. Now, now, wait a minute. Now, I, those drugs, those drugs are typically used for the treatment of ADHD. Right. And I've heard that that's used in college by college students 
studying for midterms right. or for final exams, those are part of the problem as well. Definitely, and they call it the study drug. And I just just a, a student recently watched our film and had been using Adderall during finals, didn't have any idea that if he kept doing that, he could become addicted and it can lead to other types of drugs that they start wanting to take to add on to their addiction. And it's a huge problem in the college system, even in high school, but certainly in college. One of the things that, that the show covered was the progression of how that takes place. Right. Share with us how that progression takes place about you're starting with prescription drugs and how easy it is to cross over into addiction itself. Right, so you know many times first of all the teen brain is still developing so it's not the same as an adult brain so this is why we're we're hitting with the teens early on to hope, to hope that they won't go there but the teen brain is very pliable when they start using a certain substance it, it alters the chemistry of their brain and some teens will then need more or need different things. So they might start out with something, even alcohol or even pot, marijuana, and then they might start experimenting with other drugs and then eventually the brain actually has a, a, a switch that takes place. Is this the equivalent of back when uh, I was coming up in the 70s and 80s, there used to be this commercial with a frying pan oh, yeah. where right. they crack the egg and this is your brain on drugs. Right, right. Is this the equivalent of an update of that speech? It is a little bit, but mm -hmm. the, the problem with that speech is that you had no explanation of why it's bad. It's just bad. Now we need to tell teens and their parents that here's what's wrong. If you start using these substances, there's a very high likelihood that you become addicted and your brain changes forever. There's no cure and once you pass that line. So what we're doing is we need to educate people and you know like you mentioned some some kids start out with minor drug you know alcohol and lower end drugs and they start using the prescription drugs. Well those drugs are extremely expensive on the street. So then they transition to the heroin, meth and other types of drugs that they can get on the street which is still very bad. They're, they're all bad. But they're cheaper? They're, yeah, if you go from an Oxycontin type of addiction to a heroin addiction, it's a much cheaper, so that's where many Oxycontin addic addicts end up going. So this issue is so important to you that you started your own nonprofit. Right. Tell us about the work of the nonprofit. So basically this, this nonprofit is an organization that does projects. So we decided we need to educate and, and drive awareness, so we created the project for the documentary. Um, we also have people in our organization as volunteers that go out and speak to the community at any forum that we're asked. So there might be a community forum, it might be a high school. Um, we've spoken at different um, young people's organizations and we will, what we'll do is we'll gather a group of people that can come and talk about what's going on and the realities mm -hmm. of what's happening to our teens. When, for, for the folks that are watching this show right now, mm -hmm. for parents and mm -hmm. families, what do they need to know that most of them don't? or may have a misimpression about? So one of, one of my key messages to folks is that we really need to be alert to what's happening. Many people from my age group, they, they think, well, you know, I might have done that when I was a kid. It's, you know, I, I survived it. Well, kids are not surviving it. It's, it's much more drastic nowadays with prescription drugs and some of the other drugs going on. So be alert to what's happening. Don't, don't take, um, you know, drinking or smoking as, as just a rite of passage. Just don't. And one of the things that a study from Placer County showed that 45% of the parents there think it's okay to serve alcohol to teens in their home. What? Yeah, it's, it's outrageous, it really is. And, and parents think, well, if the kids are home, they're safe. But the problem is, well, first it's illegal. Second is, you know, you're, you're actually helping alter a, a teen, their health, their brain, and you know, everything that they're doing and making it okay for them. Because if they're gonna be doing it there, they're gonna be doing it other places. And it's never okay. I, if it, there was one message I could get across is that's never okay. Maybe that explains a phenomenon that, that I've heard about, which is that, there are so, there's so much focus on creating these safe and sane environments for teens mm -hmm. to hang out and recreate in, and they're, they're drug-free zones. Right. But what I've heard is, is that what some of these young people do is that they'll go to someone's home where right. the parents aren't around, or maybe they, according to this Placer study, maybe they are around, and they'll drink or they'll do whatever it is that they're going to do drug-wise, right and then they'll go to the safe right. and clean, protected well, zone. It's, it's very much happening, and I'll tell Which you Which is scary prom, from prom, the standpoint. It is very scary. Yeah. It happens all year long, but prom night's a really good example. A lot of kids 
will go to where they're supposed to go, maybe a dinner at one of the parents are hosting or whatever, then they go and they party, and then they go to the prom for a very short period of time, and then they leave and party, and then they come back to the prom to get picked up or whatever the, the scenario is. So there's always gonna be ways, and I think as parents, we need to be very vigilant to talk to our kids. Studies show the more you talk to them about substances and what it can actually do to you, um, it lowers the risk. Really, so you're saying that, uh, that talking to your kids actually does make an impact, yeah, they actually do hear 50 that? 50 percent less likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, the parents that actually take the time to talk and talk often to their kids, there's many studies that show this. Okay, let, let, let's talk a little bit about your other work. Okay. Y you were an executive with Hewlett Packard and your work spanned the globe in terms of the workforce that you ended up being in charge of and the work mm -hmm. that you did. And the culmination uh, of that work in some ways is contained in this book, Woven Leadership. Right. And in Woven Leadership, you, you make a very, very interesting point, which I, I'd like to read to you. The important challenge of today's leader is to stress the positives of colorful, inclusive teams while smoothing out the wrinkles that can pop up when team members clash in approach and style. Like a modern day Rumpelstiltskin, today's leader has to be able to spin the raw materials of very skilled employees and spin them into the gold of an efficient organization. And so there's a lot of talk about diversity in the workplace and the power of diversity, mm -hmm. but mostly it's talk. And cynics believe all of this is this feel good crap. Right. How does that actually impact the bottom line? Tell us about what led to the book. Well, I will, you know, my whole career at HP, I was doing various transformations. So I was taking teams and building um, new organizations, consolidating the last probably 15 to 20 years at HP. And what I found was when I had people that were all very homogeneous in their perspectives, in their experiences, we weren't very creative. So when I would bring a team together and reorganize and transform it into a more diverse organization, we would soar, and I have an example of this where I had a, and it took on team, managing a team across the Americas, so it was serving uh, product support basically, and it was serving Canada, U.S., and all of Latin America, but all of the managers were from the U.S., all men, and uh, one African American, the rest uh, white males in about the same age group, and wonderful people, very skilled, very good leaders, really knew the business, but we were really missing, we had blind spots. We didn't understand Canada as well as we could have or Latin America, and what was happening is many of them would spend a lot of time in those countries, so it was costing money to travel there and even have an apartment in some cases because they had to spend so much time in these um, remote places. So when I reorganized the team, I brought in managers, one from Canada, a couple from Latin America, and, and really made the diversity fit the actual customer base. We saved money because we had less travel. We were more innovative at the start because we had people on our strategic planning that actually knew the customer better. We had stronger partnerships with the people in those countries because they saw that their own, their own people that understood their organizations and their, their customers were at the customer support group and there wasn't as much rework. So we really did save on the bottom line and we increased customer satisfaction at the same time. How do you respond to someone who says the following? And, and I'm telling you this because I have a friend who happens to be a white male who says, there's no definition of diversity that's being bandied about these days or I'm included in it. So I'm not part of the solution, I'm always part of the problem. How do you respond to that? Well, I disagree because if you're looking at a diverse team, you need to look at all aspects. Diversity is not about just bringing people of different ethnic, I mean, that's just one piece. And mm -hmm. in my book, I really make a point that we're looking for what I look for is different perspectives, different personalities, as well as different cultures. And if I was to manage a team that was, you know, all African American or all, you know, one or the other, I would say, okay, we need to fix this. So I can understand why someone would feel that way because the pendulum was so far the other way. You, you know, look at boards. You're 90 percent men and more than 90 percent just Caucasian so sure. so there has to be a time when there's a time to to make a push to say how can we be more inclusive um, but it has to be everything I I can see how so, people feel that so way. let's talk a little bit about the continued resistance to this notion because the the reason that I inquired about mm -hmm. how does this impact the bottom line right. is because usually the the first blowback is 
there is no way, this is all sort of social justice mm -hmm. mumbo jumbo, but this has nothing to do with us being competitive as a global company, of us gaining market share, mm -hmm. of us delivering a higher earnings per share. Right. And obviously there are examples where that's not the case. How come that argument, though, hasn't been put to bed yet? You know, that's why I'm bringing it up. I'm bringing up, I, I want to look at diversity differently than we have in the past. In the past, mm -hmm. it's been about the social justice and affirmative action. Sure. I mean, that's been a push. Throw that out and look at it as a competitive advantage. If you hire all people like yourself, whatever yourself is, whether it's your industry, your personality, or, or maybe your culture, what are you going to get? You're going to get people that think like you. You're going to get a certain product and output that is what you can do on your own. But if you were to create a team that has multiple different facets to it, you're going to expand that creativity and get new solutions. So, so what you don't know... Isn't it also messier, though? It is. It, it can be. Mm -hmm. And there are times when you have to look at, and I've had teams where I brought two teams together during the, the Compact and HP merger. I was in charge of the Americas merging together, uh, the enterprise help desk and service desk area. And it was very conflictual because you had two different cultures. HP was a, known as a car, very partnering culture. Um, Compact was a very aggressive culture because they had a different type of product base. We brought the two teams together and both teams clashed quite a bit and there was a lot of um, feedback, well, why don't we just go with one team or the other? And I thought, no, if we do that, we're going to lose all the, the, the good things about both cultures and both sets of groups. So I merged the teams together, and, and during that year, we came up with much more innovation. We pushed the envelope on both sides. So, you know, if you have a team that's all the same, and, and you think, well, we're working well, we're getting earnings, we're, we're, we're performing well, my, my challenge is, how much better could it be? And will you be able to weather changes in your customer base and changes in the economy without bringing in differences and different perspectives. I think it's an untapped competitive advantage that I really encourage companies to take a serious look at. And if they don't, in this increasingly interconnected and global world, what do you think happens to the companies that don't take this seriously? I think that they're going to languish, and I think that the companies that do take it seriously are going to know, they're going to look at their customer base. And we have, we have companies with, with boards and so on that serve 90% of a women population without any women at the seat. What would change if there was women at the table? I mean, that's my question. What would change? I think some things would change. I think there might be some innovation that wasn't thought of by the group. Which leads into a second a component of your book, which is talking about authenticity. Why is that such a key component of your leadership vision? Well, I start with diversity in my book and I end with authenticity. And, and I look at it this way. You have to embrace those things of every, you know, the people that you want to know in your world. You need to embrace their differences and, and be okay with that. But you also need to embrace your own differences and own them. So many times in a company and organization, we hire someone for their talent and their perspective and then we quickly try to conform them to our group. And we lose the very thing that we hired them for or brought them in for. We try to make them fit in. And I really challenge folks to look at bringing folks in and letting them flourish. And what it starts with is doing that on your own. You know, even as children and, and teens, you know, you want to be fit into your peers. There's, sure. there's all these kind of group dynamics. Um, the world would just be a better place in terms of competitive advantage if we brought people into our teams and, and really held their differences as something that we we value and that we want to keep in the mix so that we don't lose that and we keep the creativity and, and um, innovation going. And all of this stems from somewhere. From, from whom do you draw inspiration? Who, who inspired you? Well, I'd be remiss to not say that my, my parents were, have been a huge inspiration in my life. My father is an admiral, was a retired, he's a retired admiral in the Navy and started the first commanding officer of Top Gun and had a very distinguished really? career. And, and whenever I had a lot of operational things. He was a great mentor for me because he led fleets of ships and so on. And uh, my mom was a very successful mortgage banker and one thing that I learned from her was she had employees that would just were so loyal because she took care of them. She really understood the value of the team. And I think you have different people along your journey. And I had a uh, manager that I worked for at HP, Larry Welch, who was the diversity manager at the site. He ran diversity council and he made diversity objective. And he measured us. He didn't just say, you know, oh, let's put this on the list because we should. 
we actually talked about it at our reviews and talked about how we were bringing different diversity and I think I really learned from him that you can take action. So there's been various um, leaders along the way that I've encountered. I, I've had people outside of HP that have been very instrumental when I w decided to leave HP. There was someone that I met with that was really helpful in understanding how you lead in your life and how um, you know, you're, you're more than just your job type mm -hmm. of thing. So. Well, I want to come back to you talk about the Diversity Council. Mm -hmm. One other comment in the book that you talk about is how you were raised in a family where you grew up to be colorblind. Right. And the question that often comes up is, is it really possible to be colorblind? And I've heard really compelling arguments on both sides right. of that equation. I'd like to hear yours. Well, you know, I, I specifically put that in there, and I'll explain that, you know, we are born without prejudice, right? When, when the child comes into the world, it's, it's really how you're raised, the environment you're in, the things you're exposed to. Of course, you're going to pick up opinions and, and things that you, it's just natural as the way we, are, we, are, we grow as individuals. But being in a family that's not being judgmental and prejudiced and, and you know, saying things that are, that are harsh about other people, was a gift that I had, and, and I, I feel like even though being truly colorblind, if you want to take it to the very extreme, of course you're going to recognize the differences um, in good ways, and maybe sometimes you, you draw opinions of your experiences, um, you're just going to do that. But I think in general, if we, if we can do what, was, what I had the gift of doing, which was making it not okay. I mean, I moved from San Diego. My dad got um, stationed. We moved to Alabama in 1969, six, around that time frame, right when segregation was just um, made illegal. And we went into that environment from a standpoint of being very sheltered, that there was even segregation. You know, me was living on base and the way my parents were raising us. But I realized at that time that I didn't have a I didn't have a um, notion of, you know, this is bad, that's bad. It was just, these are people, and um, that's, that's the way I, I look at it. The other side of that coin, though, is that does that sort of, like, like smooth, dull the edge so much that you can't recognize difference? That, that maybe in striving to be absolutely blind to difference, mm -hmm. that um, part of what you talk about as the strategic value mm -hmm. of diversity gets lost because um, you're, you're either willfully or socialized not to well, pick up on those that, things. That's a good point, and I, I think that the point is not that you're not looking at differences, because I, I very much believe that the differences are what make us unique and we need to recognize and value and celebrate the differences. It's about putting a judgment on top of that difference mm -hmm. that says, you know, I look at this and I, I just immediately, just from a visual, say, this is bad, you know because the person is a certain color or they're dressed a certain way. It's more about, you know, sure you're gonna categorize, you know, people in different ways that, that you think, okay, that person might, must like the beach because they, they're dressed this way. Of course you're gonna do that. But in terms of limiting people's opportunities, not including them, not including their opinion because of uh, their color or their preferences, um, that's where I'm looking at being colorblind and as a notion. Another interesting aspect of your background is how you stepped off of the fast track in terms of what obviously was an extremely successful career mm -hmm. and decided to make a change. There are many folks who are looking or at some point are going to be facing a transition. How did you face that and, and what can you share that worked for you in, in making that transition into entrepreneur from executive. Okay. Yeah, it's just been amazing. The last three years, I, I decided to leave, well, actually, really started deciding to leave about four years ago when I was still at HP, and I realized I really was ready for a change. I loved my career. I loved working at HP and the people and all the wonderful things I got to do and the challenges I had and accomplishments, but I really was ready for a change. And it started with a, a shift of really wanting to do more in the community you know, do the film, and, um, and I serve on various boards. I was uh, in American Leadership Forum, which was a big catalyst because I got to be around a whole bunch of people that were truly making these changes or living a life of purpose. And, mm -hmm. and so, so it, I thought long and hard, and I met uh, with a few people. And one of my friends that I and mentors that I met with, you know, basically gave me a lot of good pointers because she had done the same thing. And she said, you know, you can you can leave and pursue your your interests and passions and 
you're not interested, if that doesn't work, you can you can go ahead and do something different. But and I, in our last 30 seconds, tell us what would be the, the couple rules of the road that you would advise us? To making that shift? Yes. Um, to really look at, well, first of all, you know, set yourself up in a way that you can have some bandwidth. I have some, yeah, I have been able to, I saved a lot in, in the process of working at HP, which gave me a little bit of, of um, runway. But you can also do things like decide really what you want to do and start pursuing those interests even before you leave your position and, and get hooked into networks and, and meet people that are in the areas that you're interested in so that when you do make a transition, you have a, a group of folks that can support you and actually help you in your business. Networking is huge. I underestimated that when I was at HP because I was, I was all over the world besides right. here. And we're going to have to leave it right there. Kim, oh. <laughs> thank you for a fascinating conversation. Congratulations on your Emmy win. And we look to see, hear and see big things from you in the future. Thank you, Scott. It's all been right. a pleasure. Well, that's our show. And thanks to our guest, and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.